I'm so glad to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm Kathy Toffel, and I have the privilege of leading the Android and iOS teams at Meetup. Uh, and you can see there's Joao. We have some nice Meetup shirts uh, here, too, if you uh, want them. So come after. Yes, yeah, so sometimes I also go by in my initials, uh, KT. Um, so anyway, I was recently talking with Kevin and Jeff after an Android developer meetup uh, that we hosted at Meetup. They like saying that, a meetup uh, at Meetup. Um, and they overheard me talking about my role uh, at Apple uh, bringing OpenGL to the platform. And, and I'll get to that. And, and you heard Jeff talking about, uh, and Boris talking about being in it for the love of it. And that's sort of why we stick around uh, long term. Uh, I love events like this. I love everybody getting here and leveling each other up uh, and uh, sharing what we know as developers. Um, so thanks, Kevin and Jeff and your team for having me. Um, and uh, so I'm going to try to weave together those two ideas, and we'll see how I do. Uh, and I've had a, a, a time of it because um, I first think it would be really privileged of us to not acknowledge what's going on outside these walls uh, here in the US and around the world. Uh, it's kind of a little crazy right now. Um, I was in Spain a week ago and had to be rerouted uh, around, uh, up over Scotland and Iceland to get to New York, uh, landing last Tuesday. And, um, and now 3.5 million Americans are without power right now. So it's a real privilege for us to be here in this room sitting and listening to each other. And we should um, really be aware of it and recognize and honor that we get to be here doing this today. Um, and uh, apparently this Sunday talk shows, I, I just read Twitter and I continually get triggered by it, but the Sunday talk shows talked about this for about six minutes yesterday and spent a lot of time on something else. So I'm constantly being triggered by Twitter these days. Uh, and, and you know, the thing about it is, is that what I love actually is technology. I love losing myself in the moment. I love thinking about the future. I love thinking about apps and app development and what my team can do. And I get tr triggered by Twitter. And so I imagine that I'm not alone because I hear that I'm not alone. Uh, and, and so what I want to do is see if I can take you on a journey uh, back in time uh, and, and see why I uh, still have such hope for technology and why I'm still in it and love it and keep doing it. Uh, so I want to start by talking a little bit about that trip to Spain, because I was so regenerated by going. Uh, I had the privilege of speaking uh, in Logroño. Uh, but, uh, so I'm going to talk about progress. Then I'll go back to some personal history in the Bay Area and really talk about uh, what it means to invite participation. Like you see Jeff and Kevin inviting participation and the team at DroidCon all around the world inviting participation to come and speak internationally. Um, now, to be fair, this is going to be a little Apple-oriented, uh, but I mean, how many of you are using a Mac to use Android Studio? Yeah, okay, so you'll like the story. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about values and openness, and then I'll wind up back here in New York uh, and talk a little bit about integrity. Uh, so we've made some stunning progress as humans and developers. Um, we're really the ones here in this room changing the world. Um, and another way of thinking about this quote from Thomas Arnold is that we really do stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, none of us came fully formed from Zeus's head, uh, ready to unleash our amazing code skill, skills on a, on a fawning public. Uh, we start with Pythagoras, maybe, and, and we go to Bell Labs in ARPANET, and, and then maybe, maybe we get to start talking about our own stuff. So we are nothing in and of ourselves. But together, we've made some really great stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So I, I was in Logroño, and I decided to spend a couple days in Madrid afterwards. So I booked a hostel with an app. Uh, I like staying in hostels to get to meet people. I'd probably be a really terrible director at Meetup if I did not like meeting new people. I did this all last minute, and the trains were booked up, uh, so I took the bus. And uh, so then once in Madrid, I took the metro to my hostel. Uh, so I get to the hostel and get settled and make my way to the social area to see if there's anyone who's looking for an adventure. I see a maybe likely candidate, 
and sit near her. We eye her each other for just a little bit. And she says, habla espanol? Nope, I say. But I take out my phone and use Google Translate to ask how many days she's going to be there. She's leaving the next day and had been in transit for 24 hours. She switches to English, thankfully, and asks me where I'm from. So I say New York, and, I, and she replies where she's from. I can't understand her, so I pull out the maps, and she navigates to Rosario, Argentina. She asks me what I do for a living, and I try to explain Meetup, and she says, oh, like Tinder. And I say, oh, for more than one person. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I show her some meetups in Buenos Aires, and uh, she downloads the app. Uh, and I guess I passed her test because she said, hey, do you want to go uh, out dancing, salsa dancing? Uh, she travels every year from uh, Rosario to visit some of her family outside of Barcelona, and she stops at Madrid uh, uh, once a year. And she went there the last year. It's called La Negra Tomasa. Sounds great. I'm just looking for an adventure. I kind of don't care what the adventure is, as long as it looks fun. Um, I would never have found this place or gone in uh, without her wanting to go. So we exchange numbers and connect via WhatsApp, because she doesn't want to play for international text or roaming. Uh, and we meet up in a half hour to go out, and we navigate to this little club via a map. It's only like a seven minute walk from the hostel. I would never have found this place without her. And there was this wonderful band playing, four women uh, playing salsa. They're called Chicas de la Habana. Uh, I look around. There's an entire bar filled with uh, glasses of mint. And I think they're going to make mojitos with them. I see this guy, uh, a, a picture on the wall, and point it out to Sandra. And he says, oh, that's Shea Vicavera. He comes from my hometown, Rosario, near the house I grew up in. Small world. I found my way to a Cuban bar where the person who was randomly in the, next to me in the hostel uh, found some picture from the guy who was on, uh, from her hometown. Kind of fun. Anyway, this is Sandra. Uh, and she found someone to dance with, and I found some mojitos, and it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we all <laughs> went, went home after a few hours of having some fun. I, what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful world this is. It's so much progress. Look, I could not have done that 10 years ago. Nobody could have done this 10 years ago. I couldn't have done it five years ago, maybe, maybe not even three. Um, the, we've had some just amazing, amazing progress. Um, and, and so, so the, I guess the last bit there I forgot uh, is this, um, uh, the next day I went to the Riena Sofia. Uh, anyway, it's, a, it's got a Picasso's Guernica, or uh, I was told to pronounce it really well, Guernica. Uh, I don't probably put, put it still. Um, so anyway, it's, it's easy to let yourself get weighed down by current events uh, and not look up to see some of the real progress that we have made together here in this room, the community has made leveling each other up. I think that's just fantastic and it's one of the reasons why I stay in it. Uh, and, and the future is unevenly distributed. I love this quote by Huxley, uh, and, and here charity doesn't mean giving things away, uh, but generosity of spirit, inviting participation, what I want to call it here is someone from South America who some people here in the United States might still consider the developing world, was able to have an equal experience to me, an elite New Yorker, using apps on a smartphone. And, and some of that is because Android has such a worldwide uh, penetration. Uh, and the Android ecosystem is what made us equals. I thought that was amazing. Uh, and I'll come back to that. But so. I'm going to move on to a little bit of an, the inviting participation bit. Um, when I reached out to a former colleague about my topic today, and that's what she said, what a long, strange trip it's been. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area today is full of techie hipsters. Uh, but back in the day, there were hippies, even in Palo Alto. They listened to a lot of Grateful Dead. They played a lot. People followed them around the country. And I know you're wondering, where the hell am I going with this? It's OK. It's a long, strange trip. Uh, uh, the, Bay, the, the Dead was playing, even into the 90s, they were playing arenas. Uh, they had opening bands. Uh, those opening bands would get a lot of attention after opening for the Grateful Dead. Uh, maybe they needed an intern to help manage fan, fan mailing lists so they could focus on the music. Uh, that's, that's me. I went to UC Berkeley for college and didn't know really what I wanted to do afterwards. 
Uh, here I am winning a county trigonometry contest. It's kind of a predictor for my whole career in tech. <clears throat> uh, back, back at Cal, uh, in my junior year, I decided maybe I should do something career-oriented rather than selling used clothes. So I, I went to the job board. I just got into my head one day. One day I got into my head I should go to the job board. And I saw this listing. The listing read something like, Four woman multimedia band needs intern to maintain fan database and send bulk mailings, send email to tukuku at well.com. So uh, before Mosaic and Netscape and Chrome, uh, there was the well. Uh, if you wanted to connect with other hippies who read Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog, or just uh, find some like-minded individuals who happen to have a computer and a modem. I think billions of people now, if I can count all of those uh, little phones, have some sort of connection to the internet now. And it's kind of amazing project, progress. But back 25 years ago, the future was still unevenly distributed. But I interviewed with the band leaders, uh, Candace Pacheco and Tina Blaine. I got the position. I maintained their fan database, which meant typing in fan email and mailing addresses into a FileMaker Pro database. We sent bulk mailings about upcoming shows through the post office. Not everyone had email yet. I also learned a lot. This is a piezo crystal. Uh, piezos complete a circuit through pressure. Uh, the band had built MIDI controllers to build custom instruments. So let me show you what that looks like, and maybe you can hear a little bit of it too. <laughs> in Japanese taiko drums and African marimba. So they made controllers on those shapes and then programmed a rack of samples to um, play and trigger whenever uh, they hit the, the keys. Uh, the piezo uh, crystals were triggered by the percussive wave generated by hitting the mouse pads. So the, you didn't actually hit the piezo crystal because it would break. They had to scoop out from the mouse pad. Uh, so it was actually literally the wave caused by hitting uh, that, that hit the uh, piezo crystal that made all of those sounds that you just heard. Um, uh, so so Dukuka really loved participation. Uh, and where they learned marimba in Africa, uh, anybody could pick up a couple sticks and join their circles. And, Again, this is a story about Berkeley and hippies, not Stanford. So if you went to the Berkeley Student Union back in the day, you'd also find a bunch of bongo drums playing. Oh my god, all, all hours a day. It was amazing. Anyway, so Dukuka really wanted and valued audience participation, interactive multimedia, and built a few things to encourage it. Um, on the bottom, you can see what they called a midi ball. And this was a weather balloon filled with a radio. And when the audience hit it, it would trigger. Come on, you can do better than that. Let's get it going. <laughs> so, the midi ball was one way, and this little character, Rigby, is another. Rigby was generated in real time by Silicon Graphics Iris Indigo. Uh, Rigby's facial fig figures and position were controlled by a digital puppeteer, Ron Fisher. It was designed by Maggie Hopp. And then this lady, Linda Jacobson, was the voice of the MC. So you heard that vocoder, that auto-tuned. That was her voice up on stage. Uh, SGI was so cool at the time. Their CGI was in Jurassic Park. Uh, and they were really pushing the boundaries of what computers could do. Uh, and they had the software Iris GL. And Linda actually ended up being SGI's VR evangelist. I thought this was all amazing. And I learned about GL from Linda and Ron. Other VR enthusiasts came to Dekuku shows, including Mark Pesci, who wrote the original VR ML spec for web browser plugins. I think I sold him a t-shirt. Uh, eventually, Iris GL gave way to OpenGL. Uh, so one of the restrictions of I Iris GL is that it required that Iris Indigo. And, and it, you could only get access to features of that, that, that hardware. Um, if your graphics hardware didn't support a feature, 
then the application couldn't use it. OpenGL overcame this problem by providing support in software for features unsupported by the hardware, allowing applications to use advanced graphics on relatively low-powered systems. Thank you, Wikipedia. Uh, this gave software developers a higher level platform for 3D software development, not only for things like Rigby, but also genomics, visualizations, and games. It was so inspiring to be with DeCuco as an intern uh, in college. I learned so much of what computers could do uh, other than writing papers. Uh, when I was over one day entering fan data, uh, Candace came out a little disheveled and she just muttered something about write, up all night writing code. Like, code, what's code? So she had told me what it was and I was like, oh, so that's how all of this is wor we're working. It's like, you're writing code, that's amazing. So I took a Pascal class at Cal. Uh, and uh, so now, Ken's, uh, Candace's then boyfriend, now husband John, had an office at the Cougar's warehouse. He was so cool. He had his own software company. It was so cool. Uh, so, so, so cool. I had such a cyberpunk addic sci-fi addiction then. It was so cool. Um, so I printed out my school project and put it on John's chair uh, uh, for a critique. And I guess it was okay because he suggested that I interviewed at his company after I graduated. And yeah, I printed it out. Um, he's such a great mentor to me uh, over the years. Uh, his company was called OSC, or Obscure Software Company. I didn't get a job as an engineer, but you know, at 22 years old, right out of college with only one programming class, I got to do practically everything at the six-person software company except the engineering. I really learned how to run a company and build software. OSC had had some earlier wins making software for professional video editors. They were using their software to income to fund a new program which wouldn't even need a hardware card, just the CPU or the AT&T 3210 math coprocessor on the new Centruses and Quadras. It used to cost tens of thousands of dollars to rent studio time or build out an audio recording studio. This software was going to do everything just on the Mac. The means of production in the hands of artists. It still cost a few thousand dollars to set up because Macs weren't cheap, but it's far less than the cost it was. Now, now, of course, you can get GarageBand for free. Um, and that's basically what OSC did uh, about 15 years before GarageBand. Anyway, I learned what compute bound meant and other terms of art and the difference between interface and low level code. I also learned about resources in a project. The Deck 2 software had resources for each color mode. I became a designer, I learned Photoshop. I'm tasked with taking the high-res color palette, that's 256 colors, down to grayscale versions as well as black and white. Those are the worst. It was really hard to make icons in black and white. But I learned. And I learned that if you thin out the graphics pipeline by reducing the amount of data that you fill it with, it, you have a wider pipe for other things, like audio channels. So people who were recording audio would take their software out of this lovely color down into one bit, and you could double the number of audio channels with this trick. Maybe I should talk about progress again. Uh, I also ran the beta program, which meant duplicating floppies and putting them in the physical mail. It cost a lot to run a beta program back then. I hope you all know how lucky you are. Uh, I also found a Teach Yourself C book on their shelf and the entire inside Macintosh set. So I taught myself C and I read human interface guidelines. So silly 22-year-old me thought that everyone in the Bay Area who went to Cal could get an internship like DeCuco and a first job like OSC, and I had no idea how lucky I was. Uh, even more than learning what a make file is, I gained values that I carry with me today. OSC had a newsletter called the Audio Anarchist that they mailed with every software purchase or digital sample library. On screen now is what they called their OSC manifesto. I kind of love everything about it. Uh, I learned some great values that have really just stuck with me. Um, and so that's the Bay Area software scene that I grew up in. It's a little different now. Ultimately, OSC followed in the Steve Jobs uh, footsteps with his slogan for the rest of us, to put the tools of creation in the hands of people, not some studio exec or a technical wizard. And those values have stuck with me for my entire career. And if you have some guiding principles, they can help when times get tough, like integrity cannot be bought. So they invited participation with this audio anarchist. You can read the whole thing. But um, they invited people to contribute to their sample libraries and share in the profit. 
They were invited participation. So now I'll get into the, the personal history. Um, I, I found some pretty ridiculous on, uh, things online when I was researching uh, this images for this talk. Uh, I guess anything on the internet must be true and remain true forever. Um, and I think we've reached peak ridiculous these days anyway. Uh, so this is, this is gonna actually be my talk on, on openness. So how did, how, did, how did that happen? Um, this is me having won a tournament in the game that Bungie made before Halo called Myth. Uh, about that time, I wrote to Steve Jobs telling him I'd be a great games evangelist in develop relations. In addition to 3D and audio, I also liked games. I guess he agreed because I got an email from the VP of develop relations, Clint Richardson, offering me a job. So let me tell you about the problem at that time. Apple was losing a billion dollars a quarter. I don't think anybody can really imagine that now. That was just 20 years ago. So as amazing things can happen in a relatively short period of time. At any rate, Apple was dying and not perceived as having a consumer business anymore, but really relegated to professionals, like uh, those people who use deck, or design professionals who use Photoshop and Illustrator. In fact, Apple used to use how long it took to open a Photoshop file as a hardware benchmark to sell its products. So Steve wanted to make the company have a consumer product, a focus. And the savior would be this iMac. Uh, and that was cool and all. But the first thing I noticed was that the first version that they were going to announce only had two megabytes of graphics memory. So if you do the math on a 640 by 480 screen, you don't have enough memory for a front and a back buffer. If you look at the difference between the Rev A and the iMac, it's that the second one has six megabytes of graphics. I'll tell you that five months is a huge difference in supply chain management, so I don't, I don't know that anybody could have that big of an effect so soon uh, at a job at Apple these days. Uh, so in addition to arguing for more VRAM and making sure that there were controllers uh, for the new USB port, I spent that first summer that I was at Apple in 98 interviewing game developers and publishers, trying to get them on the Mac. And you know, I took that uh, gumption that I had from writing Steve Jobs and him saying yes. He was like, just to keep asking, so why aren't you on the Mac? I asked people at EA, I asked people at LucasArts, I asked people at Interplay. Uh, and, you know, when they stopped laughing, um, they, they said, well, you, your, your technology sucks and you're not selling any computers. Why would I be on the Mac? But they opened up their door. Um, not the least of which is because most of the game developers had gotten their start on that Apple II uh, and had some affection for Apple. And they didn't want the platform to die. And you know, I don't think many people wanted the platform to die because competition is good. It's really good to have somebody holding your feet to the fire uh, so that you can become better and better. Uh, so I think competition is good. Um, but, but so I dug in a little bit, and, and so they said, well, you don't have a preemptive multitasking. You don't have virtual memory for our textures. You don't have uh, the right audio. You don't have a real 3D library. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the technical side. But then, you know, I need you to be selling a million max a quarter for me to make any kind of business case. Otherwise, it's just completely not interesting. So I, focusing in on the the 3D part of that, um, uh, I, I found that they, if they were on, on a PC, they either used 3D effects or direct 3D or OpenGL. So if, if I wanted to fix some of this problem and, and have there be a decent 3D library now, they had a 3D library on, on the Mac, but you know, if you don't have anybody using your APIs, it's as if it doesn't exist. So there's no way that with, with that kind of barrier, we were going to get anybody to use the native API. I think it's a little different now with Apple coming out with Metal, trying to get people to use it, although I'd stick with OpenGL. But, um, but so, so we were never going to have anything uh, successful with the Microsoft product. And I left 3D effects in OpenGL. Um, my boss in developer relations set up a meeting with the hardware team, John Rubenstein, uh, as SVP and his team. 
I made a small presentation comparing the options, 3D effects and OpenGL. And I said, oh, well, you know, obviously if you're thinking about games, you want to go with 3D effects because they have more developers and will immediately get games on the platform because the API will just come over and their developer relations team will get all of the game developers on. OpenGL only has that one guy, John Carmack, uh, and uh, it's a big name, but only one, one, one guy. So I suggested that, that 3D effects would do better because that's what I was tasked to focus on. Uh, and, and so then uh, I think John asked me, John Rubenstein, so what would you do if you weren't focusing just on games? I said, oh, well, that's obvious. I'd go with OpenGL because the Mac could then be like a low-end Indigo. Instead of $10,000, it would be $2,500 to have a rendering machine. Uh, and then you could get all the open source BSD genomics visualizations on it when Mac OS X comes out and has Unix as its base. And then the 3D rendering software like Maya will come to the platform. And if you ever wanted to do like 3D Chrome on an operating system, you could use a graphics chip to offload the task from the CPU, freeing it up to do more, just like OSC with those audio channels. You could hear a pin drop, and it was clear that I'd said something that maybe hadn't occurred to people. So the hardware team picked OpenGL. And uh, that's really what I wanted. But you know, you can't do anything by yourself. Uh, again, we needed developers, and we only had maybe that one guy, but we hadn't even talked to him yet. Uh, so um, my boss had me assemble a games advisory board at Apple. And uh, we would get Steve in the room, and we'd get the developers, and we'd try to get them to open GL. Uh, and so this was my, my one time where I really got to watch Steve in action in a small room. And it was kind of amazing because, um, you know, he made all the arguments that I'd made from 3D effects and OpenGL, losing direct 3D. Heck, he threw Pixar's RenderMan into the mix, as if you could use that for real-time 3D. And I think uh, Carmack corrected him on that point. Uh, and so Steve looks at him. So, John, if we brought OpenGL to the platform, would you bring your stuff over? And John said yes. That was awesome. Great moment. And uh, so then everybody else in the room did too. Um, and, and, and John Carmack also really helped the graphics team at Apple do a bang-up job doing full-screen uh, GL context. And it wouldn't have been the same without his participation. So what Steve was doing was inviting participation in the platform. I know a lot of people talk about Apple being a closed platform. Uh, but he gave up the Apple app API, QuickDraw 3D, to invite participation. Again, with the Mac, uh, we got BSD, Unix, and th there's a little bit of things that I still miss about Mac OS 9, but there's a heck of a lot more developers now. Uh, so inviting participation. The rest is a little bit of history. Uh, Apple bought John Stoffer's GL uh, implementation for Mac OS 9, and he brought it to the Mac and other op Apple OSs. A lot more developers le learned OpenGL as a result. Apple started using frame rate, uh, games frame rate, as a benchmark instead of opening Photoshop files. Oh my god, so amazing. Uh, and had just a little bit more consumer success. I'm guessing that Google wouldn't have brought in GLES to Android if there weren't OpenGL developers. Or maybe it's because they took over SGI's old Menlo Park campus. I can't speak to Google's decisions, though. But I'm still secretly pleased that you can draw a line from every Apple device's windowing system back to that room in Cupertino with Steve and the developers and me, and that room with John Rubenstein and the hardware team choosing between 3D effects and OpenGL and me. Back to Linda Jacobson and four kick-ass women who hired an intern uh, because they opened for the dead. And now we have all of that in our pocket, audio, 3D, internet, more horsepower by orders of magnitude than that SGI Indigo. And one of the things that keeps me at it in the game is to really see the results of what you put out into the universe, for better or for worse, to be continually surprised by the novelty of other people's creativity. Uh, so when you put something out there and invite participation from others, the payback is immeasurable. And, and that kind of keeps me uh, going still at Meetup. Um, you know, I'm not doing any code, but 
uh, my team is, and every single meetup that happens now since I got there, I have like a little secret pleasure that, wow, there's people showing up and giving each other knowledge, or you're going running or doing yoga. It doesn't really matter. It just makes me happy. Uh, so I hope you have enjoyed this long, strange trip through my past and some personal computing history. And I like to think that nothing's wasted. My toiling away at my first job with those stupid one-bit graphics helped me gain insights for five years later. So if you're toiling away at something you think is stupid, maybe deep down your brain will just figure out what it's going to be good for later. Uh, so let's see if we can get to, oh my god, I'm, I'm way over shit. Uh, <laughs> um, let me see if I can get to New York in the present really goddamn fast, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to borrow some street signs uh, uh, to get us there. Steve uh, used these uh, when he introduced the I iPad, and I'm, I'm going to borrow them a little bit. Because what was really interesting back in the day um, was the intersection of hardware and software. Um, where Apple today is, there were microprocessor factories and components, and all those people who were making them meeting up at places like the Homebrew Computer Club, having all kinds of impossible reactions in chemistry uh, in that amazing con cauldron. But honestly, these days, I'm not saying it doesn't happen because there are still thousands of tech meetups, but nobody's making really new controllers like this in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, so you don't have to be in the Bay Area to have that special uh, uh, intersection of hardware and software or technology and liberal arts. And there's hardly any liberal arts there because all the techies have uh, pushed the artists out. Um, so you can go to New York with liberty and enlightening the world. Uh, Welcoming people to, from all over to the age of reason. What a beautiful symbol that torches. And everyone here in the information economy who are paid because we can reason about code stand on the shoulders of giants who created a nation of laws and not men. And so here in New York, you can get these amazing intersections now with software and finance from Amex to Two Sigma. You can get uh, it from Major League Baseball to the New York Times, all the broadcast news and shows. I can't even think about enumerating all these intersections. And that's how it happens because what New York has is the density of culture. And when I lived in the Bay Area, Foursquare came out. I didn't get it. What the hell do you need Foursquare for? A meetup. Uh, for, they work with the density of culture. I think one in nine uh, people here in New York is a meetup member. Uh, so New York, with, to me, has this amazing energy with the software and all the intersections here. And I couldn't be happier to be here. Uh, I, don't, I can't tell you uh, how many people I've met who become developers because they went to a meetup. Maybe one of the developers of the apps I learned in Spain learned something in a meetup and used it in an app that helped me have that great time in Spain. And that doesn't happen by accident. It takes great organizers. It takes people like you going to meetups and presenting at meetups. And meetup itself takes great engineers and product and design. And we've got a ton of new features uh, coming this fall, starting with meetup ideas shipping tomorrow. And I, and I, Jeff, I can stop now, Jeff, but I can have uh, five more minutes. OK. Uh, so I've got just one more thing to say about integrity. Uh, Meetup is more than engineers and product and design. Code is more than software. I didn't know this, but when I joined, I learned that every single Meetup group has to be approved by our community team and conform to policies written by our integrity team. We've believed in the right to peaceful assembly, free speech, and freedom of religion. And it meant that our community team would only deny a group access to the Meetup platform if they uh, specifically directly incited violence against others. So there might have been a Holocaust deniers meetup. We wouldn't like it, but we believed that they should have a place to, to meet up. And at least the community that was happening in knew who was going and where and when they were meeting. Um, but since the election, we've seen an uh, increase in violent attacks in real life and some attacks on fundamental American values that shouldn't be a liberal, conservative, left or right wing thing. Um, we saw an influx of alt-right groups, and our, our community team didn't even know what alt-right meant. You know, there were people last week who didn't celebrate their New Year's because they were afraid of attacks on their place of worship. Uh, so that's not the world that we want to build, and so we made some new proactive mo models to identify hateful content and keep it off the platform. And, and this wasn't taken lightly. Um, but, you know, if, if you're against something, somebody for their race, religion, gender, uh, or you think that LGBTQ people have a mental illness, or you express supremacism of any kind, you can't be on Meetup anymore. Our policy manager who wrote this has a great blog post on the topic, and you should read her whole article. I'll point out something, though, that we're a private company with policy managers writing guardrails and forced by a community team 
we're not the government or the judiciary to uh, figure out what free speech is supposed to be. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but it's where we're at. And our poor community people scrounge the darkest places of the web and join mailing lists in order to learn the coded language and where people are organizing so they don't get to use Meetup. Uh, because our mission of building community is much more important to us than protecting hateful expression. And uh, uh, I know that other people have been calling on social uh, media platforms to step up, and it's not easy, but if you are in a company that wants to do this or you think they, they should, point, look, at our, look at our policy. Because uh, it's paid off. Nobody used Meetup to, on our platform last month in Charlottesville um, to really in, uh, create community, to really invite the participation you're looking for, like the, like the DroidCon here. You have to have integrity. You have to build it. You have to have a code, and you have to say what the world is that you want to, to, to build. And, and say no to what you don't want. Uh, if you don't have integrity, you're going to be blown away by the uh, blown away by the forces that are coming. It's going to get windy and it's going to get bumpy. Uh, culture doesn't happen by accident. It's built year after year by people with heart and mind coming together like this, uh, and in this amazing city to raise their kids and have some fun and move the human race forwards. And so, what's the point of this? Uh, if you're always striving to do better than the last iteration, if you're inviting participation from everyone, whoever shows up, if you have a set of values you live by, if you put building blocks out into the universe, not knowing how they'll be used, if you tolerate everything but intolerance, you're not alone and you don't have to do this by yourself. I've found that if I align myself with these principles and seek them out and seek other people out that have the same uh, principles, making stuff, inviting participation from all people, um, the bastards can never grind the, you down. They only win when you stop yourself from producing what's in you. So I know it's a distracting out there, and there's a lot going on, but for the next two days, I invite you to focus. Focus on your dream, focus on learning. Focus on meeting the people who will help you maintain integrity. Don't let anything distract you from finishing things like your current app and giving them to people. Uh, so thank you. <laughs>